Hello friends and welcome to the teaching series. Today I want to look briefly at an obscure passage from Numbers chapter 15. And this is part of the Shema, which is a series of three passages, one from Deuteronomy 6, one from Deuteronomy 11, and then from Numbers chapter 15, that religious Jews will say multiple times a day. In fact, in Jesus' day, Jesus no doubt would have recited these passages at least twice, perhaps three times every single day. And yet this passage from Numbers 15, most of us will probably never recall reading in our lives. So let me take you there, Numbers chapter 15, notice with me verse 37. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, Throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. And then over the next three verses, it's going to talk about the significance of the tassels representing God's commandments. So God says to the people, I want you to tie tassels onto your garments. Now, fashion has changed in a few thousand years. And so the way that this gets represented today for many religious Jewish people is through the usage of a talit or a prayer shawl. And there are tassels tied to the corners of this, kind of this garment that represents the garments from the ancient world. Now, garments in the ancient world were actually like cloaks or robes, and so they would have tied tassels onto four, four corners, if you will, of that. Um, today, religious Jews will either use a prayer shawl or you will still see on the belt loops, front right, front left, back left, back right, and all of that. And God has them put tassels on this. Now, what I'm interested in for this particular passage is this little obscure detail where God says, among the tassels which represent my commandments, I want one cord to be blue. Why does God do this? And ultimately, why is God saying a blue cord? Now, blue is not easy to come by in the ancient world. In fact, the way that you get blue, or it might be a little bit of like a violet hue to it as well, is through the Murex trunculus snail. Now, you get this off of the shallow coastal waters of today, the northern part of Israel and Lebanon. And in Jesus' day, predominantly this area is known as Phoenicia. Now, in 1909, an Austrian chemist did quite the experiment where he drilled the back of the neck of these Murex trunculus snails called the hypobronchial gland and did that for 12,000 snails and out of that was only able to get 1.4 grams of pure refined dye. And he goes, okay, that's not what they have done. It wouldn't have been purely refined. That's way too many snails. But using crude, in that you kind of crush the snail, you get it out of its neck, is it would take about 15 snails to take one cord and make it blue on the tassel. Now, for four tassels, that's 60 snails. That's still a lot of work. And that's why blue was generally only reserved for royalty because it was so hard to come by. And that's how it's got its name, Royal Blue. There you go. Probably didn't think you would learn that today. But that still doesn't ask our answer our question, why a blue cord? Other than, okay, it's royalty, it's very precious. Why is God having them do this? Well, if you look a little bit further back in their story, when they are at Mount Sinai, God is talking about the priesthood. And in Exodus 28, we get the apparel, if you will, for the high priest. And here's a representation of the details given in Exodus 28. And you look at the high priest and you see that the predominant color is blue. So blue was connected to priests. And so you go, okay, but what does this have to do with Israel as a whole? Well, if we go just a little bit further back, we come to Exodus 19. God has rescued and redeemed Israel from their slavery in Egypt. He has brought them to himself at Mount Sinai. He calls Moses up and he sends Moses back to the people with words to speak to them. And this is now Exodus chapter 19. Notice with me, beginning in verse 4, God says this to Moses to say to the people, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. All right, we've got treasured possession here. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests. Hmm, hmm, hmm. 
and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So if we're talking about blue and we hear a phrase like kingdom of priests, we need to explore what did this phrase mean to the Israelites? And this is where setting our text in its ancient context and our six lenses with which we need to look at the text through in order to understand what it meant to the people back then, this one's really significant for us to look through in the cultural lens because this phrase meant something in the ancient world and the Israelites would have got it instantaneously. So what did they understand? Well, they have just come out of Egypt arguably the most theocratic society the world has ever seen. And what that means is that there were more gods and goddesses worshipped in Egypt than anywhere else. In fact, the highest number I've seen is 1,500 gods and goddesses. Now, that's a lot of melding together of this god with this god and this god. But you have the idea of gods and goddesses all over ancient Egypt. And if you even go to Egypt today, and I had the privilege of being there a couple of months ago, two things you see predominantly. The first is, yes, the pyramids. Now there's actually more than a hundred that have been excavated, and these are the big ones at Giza. But the other thing that you see all over Egypt are temples. And that makes sense because of how prevalent gods and goddesses were in ancient Egypt. Now, when you have temples, you have priesthoods. And so this language is connected to the worship of ancient deities in the ancient world. Now, to help us understand like what role a priest would play and what the Israelites would have understood God was saying to them, I'm going to pretend for a moment that I represent the world. Okay, I'm a worshiper who is going to come into the temple in order to offer worship to the God. But as I come to do that, I don't get to meet with the God because the God is off limits. Instead, I meet with a priest. And that's because a priest was someone who mediated the divine. They stood in the middle between the world, the worshiper, and the God. And they did so because they served as the hands and feet of the God. And it was understood among the people that the God authorized that priest to act on the God's behalf. And so they're a physical manifestation of who the God is. And it was understood that as you came to a temple and offered your worship, if to meet with the priest was as if you were meeting with the God themselves because a priest was understood to be the best representative of what the God was like. And so God says to his people, I want you to be this for me that you mediate on my behalf, you serve as my hands and feet, I am authorizing you to do this. And when people interact with you, it ought to be as if they are interacting with me. And this is why immediately on the heels, God is going to give his words, he's going to give Torah to the people to train them to be the kinds of people that they need to be because God is then going to put them in the land of Canaan, the most highly trafficked area in the entire ancient world where it served as a land bridge between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea and served as a land bridge for all of these nations who wanted to get to Egypt or Egypt wanting to get out to these big nations. Everybody had to come through the land of Canaan and God's desire in having them be a kingdom of priests and represent him is that as God sent the nations through their land, people would see how they conduct their business, how they treat one another, how they take care of the poor and needy, and they would see something fundamentally different than where they recognize this in the rest of the world, and they would go, who is it that you serve? Why do you do this? You see, for the Israelites, when God says, I want you to be for me a kingdom of priests, they would have understood this as God saying to them, you are the message. You represent me in the world. And so God wanted to make sure that Israel never forgot this identity. And that's why he says, I want you to tie tassels on the corners of your garments. It represents my commandments. And among those tassels, one cord needs to be blue. And when you see that royal blue stand out in the midst of the white, you will visually be reminded that you are my message in the world and how you choose to live your life matters. Oh, that's crazy, isn't it? I mean, you move from slave to a priest of the living God of the universe. Now, 
This identity led to mission, and this was what God gave to his people in the scriptures. But this is also the fundamental identity of God's people today that we get to be the message of God in the world. And I know for many of us, tassels aren't part of our normal way of doing things. So maybe here's just another example, is that let's say for example, that you play on a sports team and the name is the message. It's a reminder that as you wear this jersey, you are the message. Now on the back of the jersey, you generally have a number and you also have a last name because whatever you do on the court or on the field or in the track or whatever, uh, I don't know, do track runners ever have last names? Maybe not, but football, basketball, you know, whatnot, you often have a last name on the back, but your name isn't on the back of your jersey it's actually God's name because what you do represents God. You see, as a follower of of God, the reality is, is that you don't have the luxury of choosing whether you're communicating a message or not. If you are breathing, too late, okay? You are communicating a message. And the question becomes like, what message are you communicating? Uh, And is that different than the message that you would like to be communicating? Because if there is a gap, then we need to close that gap because what we do puts God on display. And so this just reminds us that what you do matters. The decisions you make matters. Uh, How you choose to treat your spouse matters. How you treat your kids, how you treat your parents how you conduct your business, uh, how you go about even playing in games of sports teams that you're part of, whether you're in elementary or high school or college or professional, or even if you're just in city league, like what you do there matters. How you play the game, what you say to the officials, it matters. Uh, The kind of jokes that you tell matters. Uh, The kind of clothes you wear It's all a message about God if you claim to be a follower of God. And so we want to think about this in terms just to step back for a moment and go, okay, I'm communicating a message. What is that message? Because you put God on display. But let's go just a couple of steps deeper here because one of the things that I found as a teaching pastor for more than a decade in several different congregations is that oftentimes people show up and whether this is a church service or mass or whatever kind of denomination or religion that you're part of, um, is that there's this sense that those people on stage are the ones who are authorized to act on God's behalf. That's not the biblical picture here. It's the idea that all of God's followers have this identity as a kingdom of priests who are authorized to act on God's behalf. And those people on stage are people who create an environment for people to enter into an experience with God. That that people on stage are there to help train you and mobilize you and encourage you and then ultimately to unleash you to go be the message the rest of the week. And sometimes I think that we forget that reality that as a kingdom of priests, God has placed us in the world because he wants to work through us. And so not only sometimes is there the sense that we can show up on a Sunday or a Saturday and go, well, I pay, you know, I give my tithe and these people should do things on my behalf and they should do things for me, that we fail to recognize that their only responsibility is to mobilize you and equip you and then unleash you to go be the message because as a kingdom of priests, we're all working on God's God's behalf. And subtly that can also, if you just have this mentality like only those people are authorized to do that, then you fail to recognize that you have a first-rate identity and calling in the world. That it's not like they have a more pronounced calling or God makes them more special. It's that God has given you the ability 
to go in whatever segment he has gifted you in, whether you are in the business world, whether you are in government, whether you're in you know sports, whether you are in entertainment or education or nonprofit, whatever sector you're in, God has gifted you to live into your skills. And as you do that, you put God on display. I mean, you're interacting with people every single day and God wants to work in you and through you so that you will put him on display through the people he brings and interacts with you. See, this is how beautiful this is when you recognize like you are the message of God. And oftentimes, I know this can feel very weighty because we go, but man, I, I, I mess up and all of that. And yeah, this is where grace and mercy and forgiveness come. And God goes, I am working with you. My Holy Spirit is available to you. And the beauty is, is that Jesus, who as Hebrew says, is a high priest, and that connects to the sacrificial system and giving an offering or a sacrifice on our behalf. But it's also this understanding that Jesus as the high priest, like we take our P's and Q's from him that he came as the best representation of God's embodied presence in flesh and blood in the world as the hands and feet that when people interacted with Jesus, they were meeting with God. And it's like, we follow in his footsteps so that we can embody that message well. And that's the beauty of being the message of God. And this is why last week we talked about this season of Lent where we walk out onto our branches and we talk about, God, where am I struggling? What's holding me back? This is why this season is so significant because we are communicating a message with our life. And if we're not communicating the message that represents God well, then God goes, let's, let's work on that. Let's get rid of those dead branches. Let's get you back on track. Because when we embody God's message well, we flourish and people experience God through us. And this is precisely why Peter, a disciple of Jesus in the New Testament, in 1 Peter 2.9 says this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, God's special possession, All Exodus 19, by the way, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Friends, we get to declare the praises of God by how we live. So may you embody that message well. Well, friends, thanks for watching. If you're watching this anywhere other than at walkingthetext.com, head over there. You can uh, leave comments. There are discussion questions to go deeper with this for your personal study, for a group study. If you know someone who just needs to hear this teaching and to be reminded that they are the message, share this with them. And friends, may you walk out the text well in your life. (music) 